the first summer that Jonathan, who's now my husband and I, were dating, Jonathan was interning and living at Massanetta Springs Camp and Conference Center, where many of us just were for our congregational retreat. He lived up in the woods at the top of the camp in a small cabin. This was also the summer that Stranger Things season three came out on Netflix. For those who are unfamiliar with the show, it's a science fiction horror show that follows a group of teenagers in the 1980s in Hawkins, Indiana, a town plagued by an alternative dimension that the teenagers both have to investigate and often fight. It's a scary show, much too scary for me, but one that Jonathan loved. So he went to watch the show, and he quickly called me after discovering that those cabin doors were not sturdy enough to feel comfortable watching something quite so scary. And he was entirely freaked out. Closed doors add a level of comfort. Sturdy doors add a level of comfort. Locked doors add a level of comfort. Growing up, the standard reminder in my house was lock the doors, whether it was the car or the house. I can hear the sound of my dad's shuffle down the steps to the back door and the thud of the bolt as he closed the door at the end of the day. It's been a surprise to grow up and discover that my family seems to be an anomaly and more people than I ever imagined often just leave doors unlocked. It's a comfort to me to know that everyone is all inside, tucked in safely, and that all is well. Whatever is outside, whether it's the creepy upside down universe of Stranger Things, or our overactive imaginations, or a real threat, or in the case of the disciples, great uncertainty, closed, sturdy, locked doors add a level of comfort. I imagine the hostility that the disciples had witnessed in those final days with Jesus. How could everything outside of those doors not just feel threatening? Just three days ago, they and Jesus were betrayed by Judas. They saw the crowd get riled up and choose to crucify Christ. They heard the words he yelled to mock their Lord as he hung to die. The disciples feared for their lives. Peter was so afraid, scripture tells us that he denies knowing Jesus three times. They wonder who might turn on us. What might those outside of this sanctuary want from us? And with this reality, the locked doors seem sensible. The disciples are doing what any of us do in the face of a terrible day. We head back home to our place of safety. We draw the curtains, we lock the door, perhaps even climb into bed and pull the covers up to our chins. It's bad out there, but in here where we can control everything, all is well. But John tells us that the disciples are here in this house with the doors locked after Mary Magdalene has shared with the disciples that Jesus is alive. The disciples are here after this pronouncement while Jesus is outside of the room where they are gathered. The news of resurrection has reached them, and yet the disciples have not gone out. They have not looked for Jesus, nor have they gone and told other people that he was resurrected. They've stayed put with the doors shut. But one of the disciples hasn't stayed inside. John tells us that Thomas isn't with the other disciples, so that when Jesus appears inside this locked room, Thomas misses it. John doesn't lead us to believe that Thomas is missing on that night simply because he was elated by Mary's news and went to tell others. Thomas just isn't there. I wonder if when Thomas got the news about Jesus, he cououldn't believe it. Perhaps Thomas's heart was hardened by the events of the last few days. Perhaps it was hardened so much that all Thomas could feel was despair. From the depths of his grief, there was no possibility of resurrection that he could believe. So perhaps the news that Mary brought is more than Thomas can bear, so he goes out. 
at least away from the others, no one else is talking about Jesus' resurrection. No one is speaking words of promise and hope. Away from the others, Thomas doesn't have to be drawn towards hope. Thomas's despair isn't unique to Thomas. Religious writer and priest Richard Rohr has said that Thomas, called the twin, is actually our twin. He's a stand-in for all of us. We, too, get caught in despair. We get caught in news cycles filled with horrific headlines. We doom-scroll our way through the, what the Internet has curated for us to see. Psychologists call this tendency of ours the negativity bias where we direct our attention more to what's wrong than what's right. There are even studies showing that we're more likely to click on a headline with a sad or concerning headline than one that sounds like business as usual or a headline that even offers a glimmer of hope. It doesn't take long for us to retreat from the possibility of resurrection, just like Thomas. Hope is a demanding emotion. It requires a willingness to be vulnerable to disappointment. So I wonder if when Thomas comes back to where the disciples are and they share that they too have now encountered Christ, his response of needing to see where the nails are are said with a veil of sarcasm to keep him safe from what might be. Sure, Jesus was here. Sure, it has all happened just like you and Mary have said so. Sure, Resurrection has come. Sarcasm and cynicism are easy ways to lock our hearts from hope. When we lock a door, we think it's about keeping the bad people out, but it's also about locking ourselves in, into the place where we feel safe, where we can tend to our wounds and we can heal. But it's also a place where we can sit in our grudges, or we can build up our resentments, and we can dive deeper into our despair. It's a place where we can lock ourselves into one narrative without encountering another one that might just change everything. And while the other disciples are the ones who physically locked the door to where they were gathered, you can say that Thomas's heart was locked from seeing the possibility of resurrection. John's story jumps ahead a week, and the disciples are again gathered behind a closed door, but this time Thomas is with them. Jesus comes to them again and says, peace be with you. With no hint of anger or rebuke, Jesus invites Thomas to see and believe that he is alive. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe, says Jesus. Jesus invites Thomas to move from a hardened and locked heart to one that will know that having hope in Jesus, having hope in God, is never a hope that leads to disappointment, but rather makes way for resurrection to be known. Thomas's next words are that of a genuine affirmation of faith. My Lord and my God. For it was never the doors locking Thomas in from the possibility of resurrection, but it was himself. And once Thomas and us, like our twin, realize that the door is open, well, nothing can stop us from walking through it if we choose to. RCPC has used the motto, the Church of the Open Door, since the founding of this congregation, thanks to Dr. G.M. Maxwell's poem of the same name. And while the poem speaks to how this church is a temple that's built for the service of God, a haven of rest for the poor, a beacon of hope for all those who plod, being the Church of the Open Door also speaks to the ways that we send people out. While Jesus appears to the disciples behind closed doors, his instructions are clear. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. For the next few months, 
we can say that while we haven't been sent out on the sorts of adventures we read about in the book of Acts, we have been sent out of the sanctuary and into this fellowship hall. But we're also sent by Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit, to participate in this ongoing mission of forgiveness, to offer this hope to others when they cannot see it themselves. The Reverend Derek Browning writes that hope is the inconvenient challenge for Christians. Hope is the inconvenient challenge for many reasons, in part because of how cynicism is so close at hand in culture, and in part how our own stories are laced with grief and tragedy like Thomas's that make it harder for us to see God's hope at hand. We'd like to stay where we are, comfortable and right where we know how the story will go, Yet this hope is the challenge for us all to cling to. Each and every week, we leave worship, sent by Christ, following the light of Christ out, to participate in this work of forgiveness, this work of hope, this work of resurrection that we know because Christ showed us first. This work of resurrection is what we're sent to do as we teach, as we practice law or medicine, as we write, as we negotiate, as we parent and as we grandparent, as we learn and as we play, as we volunteer and as we live in community. The door is open. We are being sent to walk through it. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>